Some people claim that the goal behind jihad is something far more sinister than fighting against oppression. Islam is an anti-Christ religion that intends through violence to conquer the world. Jihad was, for 1,300 years, a holy war led by the caliphate, the world Islamic state. Islam is a one-party totalitarian system. It's a one-party state that will not allow you to speak, and it will kill anybody who challenges or questions. Islam is not a religion. Islam is a very dangerous political ideology. Uh, to our society, and it's time we wake up, this is not just a nice religion, it is a political movement went, bent on world domination through the sword. That's what jihad is. We have a problem in all over the world with the ideology of hatred, which is called Islam. Jihad is not holy war, and that's a, a common uh, confusion that's found in a lot of dictionaries and even some translations of Quran, that the word jihad is translated as holy war. Actually, war is not holy, life is holy. And the reason that war is legislated in Islam is to protect life in the first place. All of that goes back to protecting the sanctity of life. And within war itself, there are so many rules and regulations that the Muslim has to follow, which are designed to protect the innocent from harm or even abuse. Unfortunately, some people claim that combative jihad is a holy war against non-Muslims or a war to spread Islam all over the world. And to prove their point, they go as far as using some verses from the Quran, manipulating them and taking them out of context, taking advantage of the lack of knowledge of their audience about the Quran. The expression holy war was introduced to the world in the literature of the Crusaders about 900 years after the death of Prophet Muhammad. Pope Urban II was the first pope to spread the idea of holy war or a crusade to the European public as a term for the recapture of holy land from the Muslims. He urged his bishops to preach to their communities, taking advantage of the Europeans' passion for religion. The symbol chosen for the crusades consisted of five crosses, symbolizing the five wounds that they believed Jesus Christ received during the Passion. The Pope and his legislators promised forgiveness and eternal happiness to the impoverished and famine-stricken Christian peasants if they would die in the Crusades for Christ. The Pope's famous words were, God himself will lead you, for you will be doing his work, Deus vault, which means God wills it. The response to his speech was far greater than even he expected. History was firmly marked when hundreds of thousands marched towards the east, predominantly from France, Germany, and Italy. European historians never had any consensus on the exact number of crusaders in the First Crusade. But most of historians claim that they were over one million men from different European countries. Some crusaders were motivated by their Christian piety and the will to liberate the city of God, while others were driven by greed and the will to establish new faith strongholds in the wealthy East. What no one can deny is the looting, plundering, abuse and pillaging that took place at every opportunity. The undisciplined rabble marched eastwards, massacring Jews in the rainland and even attacking and pillaging the Christian villagers of Hungary and Bulgaria. After the fall of Jerusalem in the hands of the crusaders of the First Crusade, all 70,000 Muslim civilians of Jerusalem were killed and slaughtered. Men, women, and children. Historians mention that their blood flowed like rivers in the streets of Jerusalem. Historically, Saladin or Salahuddin the Muslim commander who defeated the Crusaders did not kill any civilians after his victorious entry into Jerusalem. His magnanimity stands out, in contrast to what the Crusaders did nearly 90 years earlier, killing nearly 70,000 civilians. Therefore, we see that to never target non-combatants and never torture prisoners of war are two main rules of combat in Islam. 
However, the Islamic code of combat is far more extensive than these two rules. The code of combat in Islam is comprehensive and covers many social, economic, as well as military aspects related to wartime. Among its instructions is that Muslims must not destroy infrastructures. Another of the important instructions from Prophet Muhammad was, do not poison the wells. Amongst the teachings of the Quran is the protection of houses of worship. The Quran says, for had God not decreed to repel some people by means of others, demolition would certainly have come to many monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques in which the name of God is much mentioned in praise. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, don't destroy crops, don't kill animals, don't even disturb birds in their nests. He did not allow the mutilation of bodies, whether dead or alive. Also among his instructions was to bury all dead, even if the enemy fled the battlefield, leaving their dead behind them, it is the obligation of the Muslim army to bury their dead bodies like they bury their own dead. If Muslims are ordered to fight in order to repel oppression, if by fighting they themselves became the oppressors that they sent out to fight, that will be the greatest act of hypocrisy ever seen. So for that reason, in Islamic law, especially with regards to fighting, we find that the order not to oppress runs the gamut. Muslims are ordered not to poison wells, to destroy natural resources, to harm animals, to harm places of worship. In Egypt, where I lived for six years, I, I, I would walk around Cairo and still see churches that existed before the time that Islam came to Cairo, left in, in, in actually immaculate condition. Muslims were ordered not to harm anything, because if you're setting out to repel oppression, the worst thing that you can do is become the oppressor that you set out to fight. All these teachings bring us back to the spiritual jihad, as it is extremely dangerous if a person seeks to defeat his enemy before defeating his own ego. The result would be exchanging one tyrant for another. Reading the Islamic history, one has to be amazed at the level of discipline of Muslim warriors toward their defeated enemies or their citizens of the conquered countries. A few years after the death of Prophet Muhammad, an army of only 8,500 Muslims defeated the Romans and took over Egypt. They were under the leadership of Amr ibn Alas, one of the Prophet's companions, highly commended as a military genius. Jean, the Bishop of Nikiu, a city in northern Egypt, was a contemporary of the Romans' defeat at the hands of the Muslims. He wrote a chronicle which is considered by the Egyptian Christians to be the most trusted source of the history of the Coptic Church. Bishop John of Nikiu described the return of the Orthodox Pope with these words, and Amba Benjamin, the patriarch of the Egyptians, returned to the city of Alexandria in the 13th year of his flight from the Romans, where he went to the churches and inspected every one of them. He also described the way Muslims ruled Egypt in another passage. And Amr became stronger every day in all fields of his activity. And he collected the taxes which had been agreed upon. But he took none of the property of the churches, committed no acts of desecration or plunder. And he preserved them throughout all of his days. <laughs> 